Thank you everyone for joining us at King's Politics. Uh, my name is Niz, one of the co-chairs at King's Politics. We're delighted to be joined by Lord, Lord Newberger, former president of the UK Supreme Court from 2012 to 2017. Before this, he was Lord of Appeal in Ordinary until 2009, when he became Master of the Rolls. Uh, just to give a brief on the format, I'll, I'll give a few questions uh, for around 30 minutes, and then rest of the, sessions, rest of the session will go to audience questions. Um, so, as a first question, uh, you studied chemistry at Oxford. Did your non-law non background um, confer any benefits to your legal career? I think that it's a very much well-trodden ground whether if you want to be a lawyer you should read law or not. My former colleague Jonathan Sumption, who is never short of expressing a view, uh, is firmly of the view that you should not read law. My own experience is that anyone who becomes a lawyer who's read law will say that you should read law, and anyone who hasn't will say you shouldn't. And like most, uh, like most uh, things, I, I seriously think there are arguments both ways. I think, the, uh, I think the enormous benefit of reading law for three years that I didn't have, and that Jonathan didn't have, was that you immerse yourself in law as an academic subject, which is of enormous benefit uh, if, you, if, if you want to become a lawyer. Um, whereas the argument the other way, which is also justified, is if you're going to spend the rest of your life in the law, it's very useful to have another string to your bow. And both arguments are valid, and I think it's a silly debate as to which is better. Um, addressing your specific question, I would say that it had two advantages, having done science. One is that, certainly in my time, the English, um, and maybe equally true of Scottish, Welsh, and Northern Irish, education system uh, was very much geared between scientists and non-scientists. You couldn't mix your A-levels. You had to do science and maths or non-science subjects, art subjects. And as a result, most lawyers were non-scientists and were not particularly numerate. And I think the fact that I was quite numerate, thanks to my science degree, um, was an advantage in a number of areas of law, sort of peripheral or incidental topics where it helped. I was specialised in property law, there were quite a lot of valuation cases, and having a feel for figures and maths was quite useful. The second advantage I had was rather later on, uh, after I'd become a judge, I was a chancery judge, and uh, the chancery division included patent work, intellectual property work, and the patent judges tended to be people who had specialised in patents at the bar. I didn't know what a patent looked like when I became a judge. I'd never had any patent law experience. But they needed another patent judge because they were short of patent judges. And I was the only judge, apart from the one, one other patent judge, who I was the only one of the non-patent judges who had a science degree. So they asked me to do patents. And I think that helped my career quite substantially because it meant I was a more versatile proposition for the Court of Appeal and House of Lords that I had patents as an expertise that I developed as a judge. So that's the two advantages I think I can identify. After university, you entered investment banking. Yes. How, how did that transition from investment banking to uh, the legal prof profession work? Well, I... I, I at Oxford, when I read chemistry, you did three years as a normal undergraduate degree, and then you did a year's research. And it's while I was doing the year's research that I realised that if I stayed as a scientist, I would not be a very good one. <laughs> so I looked round and um, uh, decided, uh, went to some career advice people, and they said, well, it's either the law or finance. And in those days... Uh, the law involved, as it still does, quite a few exams, and finance didn't. And I decided I'd have enough of exams, so I went for finance. It didn't take me long to realise that if I had been a poor chemist, I was an even worse banker. And I looked round, and the friend, couple of friends I had who had the job that I looked to me to be most attractive was being a barrister. And I was lucky enough to have saved a bit of money uh, to be able to make the transition to becoming a, a, a barrister. You started judging in 1996. What, in this period, what was exciting about the aspect of judging? And I guess, how has judging changed over time? Do certain issues become more salient? Did you, what's the first half of the question? How, how, what was the attraction of becoming a judge? Or, or uh, at that, certain, at, at at that, that point time. in time. 
it's quite the, the, the two disadvantages of becoming a judge as against being a barrister were, first of all, the unattractive argument that being a judge is much less well paid. It's not an attractive argument because by most people's standards, judges are very well paid. <laughs> but nonetheless, if you are a successful barrister in, a, in the civil side, the non-criminal side, it definitely involves a significant cut in income to become a judge. And it's an unusual job where a promotion involves a cut in pay. And that is the first disadvantage. The second disadvantage is that once you become a judge, certain standards are required of you and expected of you, which perhaps as a barrister you aren't so conscious of and they're not so required. For instance, in 1996, I seriously had to ask a senior judge whether it was still all right for a, a judge to go into a pub. In, 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 if you'd asked that question in the 70s or 80s, the answer probably would have been no. But by the time you got to the more relaxed 90s, the answer was yes. But it's a sort of measure of how your life could be more constrained. And I remember when I was sworn in to be a judge, I almost felt I could ha hear the prison gates clanging behind me and I was committed to a more restrained life. Um, I suppose the other disadvantage is that as a barrister, as a, you were self-employed and you, a case settled, you could take two weeks off if you wanted. You could have a more flexible life as a judge you have to sit in court during term time and then the vacations are fixed and you are more constrained in what you can do in that, that way. Um, so that was the disadvantage, disadvantages. How judging has changed. I don't think it's changed enormously. I think that the pressures are probably larger, A, in the sense that the support for judges in terms of uh, the running of the courts, in terms of the way the court buildings are managed, in terms of the support from the Ministry of Justice, was not terribly good in 1996. And over the past 25 years, it has, it has got worse. Um, the court buildings are falling to bits, and uh, the court system is depending on underpaid court staff doing jobs that they're not paid for in addition to the jobs they are paid for. And the government is consistently coming up with silly ideas rather than sensible ideas to try and cure this problem. Um, and to that extent, therefore, the judge's role is um, more difficult. But the basic nature of the role uh, hasn't changed, of course. I, I suppose that in terms of the nature of the work, the biggest change since 1996, particularly if in, in, in my world, uh, when I, in, in public law, but also in private law to a significant extent, has been the introduction of the Human Rights Act. And that hasn't changed the nature of the job, but it's changed the diet and the issues. And I think I was very lucky to become a judge just before the Human Rights Act was introduced and work through it, seeing it before and after, and working out its effect and, and um, de dealing with that. I think also um, we, we've seen uh, changes in the way that judges have been selected. When I became a judge, I got a telephone call from the Lord Chancellor's department. I was in a not very distinguished set, I was very good, but not very distinguished set of chambers. And we hadn't ever had a High Court judge appointed before, and I got a telephone call from the Lord Chancellor's secretary saying the Lord Chancellor would like to see me to discuss things. And I had no idea I was going to be asked to be a judge, but apparently all my grander friends laughed at me and said, that's the code for you're going to be asked to be a judge. So I felt a bit of a fool. But anyway, um, I was asked to be a judge, and you, that was called the tap on the shoulder. Um, in fact, the first time I, I said no, but three years later they came back. But now it's all very different. It's like any other uh, job. You have to apply become a, a judge and you have to get um, there's a sift of the more promising candidates by a committee and uh, then their interviews and then you may or may not get appointed. Uh, that change was introduced about 15 years ago and uh, it's quite a, initially it put off a lot of people from applying because self-important or even modest barristers didn't terribly like and solicitors didn't terribly like the idea of applying 
um, to be a judge because it would get out that they'd been rejected. <laughs> um, and um, so that, but it, that, I think systems calm down on that. But instead of all the power being in the hands ultimately of the Lord Chancellor, there's now a committee which has non-lawyers and lawyers, representatives of judges, barristers, solicitors, magistrates, and then a majority of people from outside the legal world uh, that does the selection of judges at all levels. Uh, and that, I think, has changed things. It hasn't really changed things that much, but it's changed the, the, the flavour of the job made it seem a bit less exclusive, which is a good thing. Um, I think that the committee is slightly more open-minded in some ways than the Lord Chancellor, but it's also made it much more bureaucratic. And there have been a number of other changes. Um, the role of the Lord Chancellor has... Basically, we don't have a Lord Chancellor in anything but name anymore. It used to be, until 2005 or so, a, a very senior lawyer who was in the House of Lords who was a supporter of the political party in power, but was not a committed politician. Now, we have people who often aren't even lawyers and are career politicians. Nothing wrong with that, but the trouble is the Lord Chancellor is meant to stand up for the rule of law, and if you've got somebody who's basically a highly respected, experienced lawyer, he or she will stand up for the rule of law irrespective of the short-term political interests. But if he or she is a politician with a career ahead, as he or she hopes, uh, with the Prime Minister uh, promoting them, as they hope, uh, then uh, they are less likely to adopt a, a, a responsible position if it's unpopular or politically inconvenient. And I think that has been a downside of the, of the system um, that was introduced by the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005. Um, I, I guess I wanted your reflections on, I guess, our, our system and the Supreme Court. Of course, um, of course, the UK Supreme Court cannot strike down legislation or statutes, um, but, can, but, can, but can interpret them. I guess, what are the relative stre strengths and weaknesses in comparison to, the, to, I guess, the US Supreme Court? It's an aspect, I suppose, of the fact that we don't have a constitution that stands above the legislature. Um, and the Americans do, albeit, of course, that the legislature, by a suitable majority, which in the present political system in America is inconceivable, a two-thirds majority is inconceivable in, in, in the Senate or the House of Representatives, but they can change the Constitution. But if subject to that change, the Constitution is above the legislature, so the Senate, the House, and the President can all approve a piece of legislation, but the courts can say, sorry, it's unconstitutional, and strike it down. That can't be done here. We have parliamentary supremacy. If Parliament passes a statute, the judges might hate it, but they still have to adopt it and accept it. Unusually, under the Human Rights Act, if they come to the conclusion that a particular statute infringes a provision of the Human Rights Convention, then as you rightly say, they can't even then strike down the legislation. They can merely um, declare that it is incompatible, whereupon Parliament should, and to be fair to Parliament, in all, all but one occasion it has, changed the legislation so that it complies. Um, I think one of the advantages of our system uh, is that the judges are basically less political. Um, the more political type power you give to judges, the more politics will intervene in their appointment and in the way they decide a case. And it couldn't be more starkly indicated than looking across the Atlantic Ocean at what goes on in the US Supreme Court. While in our court, in, in, in the Supreme Court here, there are undoubtedly, when I was there, were judges who were more liberal, judges who were more conservative. It was much less extreme in terms of uh, their effect. They were much less extreme in terms of their differences. And I think that was good for the rule of law. But the trouble is, the argument the other way is that you, in our system, you have a much greater concentration of power uh, in Parliament because Parliament can always override the judges. Um, and the argument, therefore, is that if Parliament... <laughs> 
uh, as it were, it takes an extreme, is, is, is composed of, has a majority of, of, of MPs who are particularly extreme in their views, uh, they can, as it were, subvert what might, many people might see um, as constitutional principles without the judges being able to stop them. But to be fair to Parliament, uh, while we may not think we have the most admirable House of Commons at the moment that we've ever had, um, it's fair to say that although governments have from time to time, and this government is no exception, made some fairly um, threatening remarks about curbing the judiciary and that sort of thing, it's quite rare that one's seen anything very serious um, in terms of threats to um, uh, the, the rule of law. But I think that uh, both systems have their disadvantages, and you can see the disadvantages at play on both sides of the Atlantic at the moment. I, I wanted to ask about the state of the jury in this country, and specifically about the Colston Four case. Uh, Lord Sumption has said that the case uh, and its result undermined the rule, the rule of law and, sort of, and displayed a sense of pessimism about the jury in this country. I just wanted your thoughts about uh, the, 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 um, the, 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 the statue. The, the, the statue case. Yep. I, th I think, again, my own feeling, maybe I'm too sort of weedy or moderate, but my own feeling is that both arguments have a, have, a, have a perfectly good basis. One of the great defences of the jury system, and it's a good defence, and I think it's one that Lord Sumption would agree with, is that in the end, it isn't the judge who decides guilt, it's the jury. And the jury, unlike the judge, have the right to declare a person not guilty, even if, according to the law, they are guilty. There's a slightly sad story about that, which I've always rather liked. It's about a man who had a large garden with a wall that went round it in a, and had an angle, and a road went round the outside of the wall. And the angle was a sharp bend in the road, and it led to a few accidents. And the uh, man decided that he was quite well off, that he would like to rebuild the wall so that the angle in the road was less bad and people could avoid accidents. And the local authority refused permission to rebuild the wall because it was a listed building. The uh, man's uh, daughter then uh, was um, tragically killed in an accident on that corner. And he just took the law into his own hands and rebuilt the wall. And in their uh, wisdom, the local authority prosecuted him. And the judge said to the jury at the end of the case, my duty is to summarize the law to you and you must take the law from me. Members of the jury, there are only two principles of law I want to tell you about. The first is that the defendant has absolutely no defense to this uh, prosecution. And the second thing I want to tell you is that there is no appeal against a verdict of not guilty. <laughs> and the other story is, before any of you were born, I think, or some of most of you were, um, the, um, a man broke into Buckingham Palace. He didn't break any locks, he, didn't, he just climbed in and got through a door. And he ended up sitting on the Queen's bed for about 20 minutes. She handled it with her customary sans foie, and in due course, detectives came and took him away, etc. And the, they were desperate to prosecute him. The only thing they could prosecute him for was when he'd been going through the palace to get to the bedroom, he'd um, found a half a bottle of wine in the, uh, in the uh, ki kitchen, and he'd drunk it. So again, the prosecution authorities in their wisdom decided to prosecute him for stealing half a bottle of wine. <laughs> the jury, very sensibly, even though there was no defense, acquitted him. It's those sort of stories. And then there are other stories which are more serious about the Ponting case where he broke the Official Secrets Act, but did so for reasons which the jury decided were, were respectable and defensible. And it's those sort of cases, and it's other cases who go back in history where juries do perform an important function, and where, if you believe in juries, you have to accept that occasionally they will decide cases against the, the law, if you like. And on that basis, this was just one such example. Lord Sumption may not agree with the idea that these people should have been acquitted. Personally, I don't think they should have been acquitted. But if we start saying that juries can only acquit people of crimes when we think they should be acquitted, we're slightly missing the point. Having said that, I, I, I do think it's slightly disquieting that juries can 
can decide in their wisdom to acquit um, some people of quite serious offences in the sense that it may set a bad example. And one has to be careful of, on the one hand, being too upset at the odd acquittal that you think is wrong, and on the other hand, um, being uh, worrying about too many acquittals in certain areas uh, leading to undermining the rule of law. And at the moment, there's been one acquittal. If there were masses of acquittals in this sort of area, then you might start to worry. But I, I, I think at the moment, um, as I say, I think one should keep calm about it. Uh, since we left the European Union, you have um, voiced your concerns about um, multiple aspects of the government's uh, Brexit strategy, whether this was our relations with the European Court of Justice or the proposed internal market bill. I guess what I wanted to ask is, do any of these concerns remain, uh, remain here forth? I think so far as the internal market bill was concerned, it was a disgraceful proposal which the government abandoned, um, I'm glad to say. Um, it didn't break English law, UK law. How could it? Because if Parliament had passed the Internal Markets Bill and it had become the Internal Markets Act, that would have become part of our law. That's parliamentary supremacy. But it was Parliament authorising the government uh, to break international law. And my view is that the rule of law is a very precious thing that we need to maintain. And it's probably certainly of far greater age and probably even more important than democratic government, certainly no less important than democratic government. And if governments start nakedly and expressly breaking laws and parliament is approving and authorising them expressly to break their commitments internationally in international law. That sets a shocking example for citizens of the very government, which the very government expects to observe its laws. And therefore, I, I think it's wrong in principle. On top of that, we spend a lot of time complaining about the way that some other countries, perhaps notably Russia, but other countries, are failing to observe international law, our moral authority just crumbles if we do the same. So yes, I, I, I took, took a, a very dim view of that. Um, I think that, that we're in danger of doing something stupid. I don't think we will, but I may be wrong, in relation to Northern Ireland, where um, anyone who considered the situation for 10 minutes when discussing Brexit, would have realised that Northern Ireland was going to be, if not an insoluble problem, a very serious problem. And uh, unfortunately, the Prime Minister saw fit to um, sign a, a, an agreement for leaving the EU relating to Northern Ireland that either he didn't read or he didn't understand <laughs> uh, or uh, he chose not to tell the truth about. But the trouble is, to be fair to him, that once we decided to leave, it was very difficult to know what to do about Northern Ireland if we, in the rest of the UK, were not to remain in the, in, in, in the single market. Um, and and uh, either Northern Ireland comes out of the single market as well, in which case there's going to be a border uh, with uh, the Republic, or Northern Ireland remains in the single market, in which case there's a border uh, between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. And there's no magic solution to that, or no magic solution which we're entitled to ask for under the deal we signed. Since the 2019 uh, prorogation of Parliament, um, it has still uh, entered discussion, and it has prom prompted the case for judicial review, which um, you believe you, you have opposed. Do you think there's any scope for reform, for reform of judicial review in this country, or does it fulfil its function? Well, the story of judicial review and, and this government's attitude to it is quite sort of puzzling. First stop, you have to be very careful um, to obj about objecting to any change to uh, judicial review. A any system of law, any rights granted, anything like that, can always be improved. 
or at least arguably improved. And therefore, the mere fact that the government intends to make amendments or says it intends to make amendments to judicial review uh, isn't necessarily sinister. And if you start crying wolf at every proposal, uh, you lose credibility and rightly lose credibility. Secondly, um, the government made some very loud noises about judicial review, particularly following the Miller 2 case, because they didn't much like the result. And I think that they then set up a committee under Sir Peter Gross. And the committee produced a very sensible report, which the government then as effectively hijacked and made some very aggressive noises about what they were going to do. But when they eventually produced the bill, which I think is due to be debated in the House of Lords next week, having been debated in the House of Commons a couple of weeks ago, finally, um, I, I actually is, I don't know if I agree with it, all parts of it, but is actually not particularly um, far-reaching or undermining of judicial review. And interestingly, it's exact, uh, we wait to see, but I suspect it may be uh, the same with human rights. We've had um, a report on, on human rights. I'm sorry, I referred to Peter Gross. It was Lord Folkes who did the review on, on, on judicial review. It was Peter Gross who did the review on, on uh, human rights. His review was, again, extremely sensible. Uh, and the government has made some extreme comments, but let's wait and see what they actually produce. On judicial review, the government is pretty free to act as it sees fit in principle. On human rights, it's very much more difficult to see what they can do because they have to comply with the Human Rights Convention, which is an international convention they've signed, unless they propose to do what they've done, with the, which they threatened to do with the Internal Markets Bill, but didn't eventually do, which was to... Um, break their international commitments. So I think that while I began by saying that we have to be careful about not shouting about every proposed change to judicial review or human rights, because there are always improvements that can be made, and even if we don't agree with them, there are arguable improvements that can be made. I do think those two aspects of the law, human rights and judicial review, are self-evidently very, very precious. And we would all do well to look very carefully at any changes that any government proposes because, by definition, human rights and judicial review involve things in which the government has a very considerable interest. And therefore, if they're proposing legislation, you could say they have a, a conflict of interest, which means that one has to look very carefully at anything they propose. Uh, last time King's Politics um, hosted Lord Sumption, and that was regarding his views on the pandemic. And I guess one aspect that he, I guess, points to is the, the impositions on our personal liberties. Um, that's, that may set a dangerous pre precedent for the future. Do you see a possibility whereby the governments from here on are more likely to act illiberal? I think there are two, two um, aspects of Jonathan Sumption's um, attacks on um, the government's approach to, or possibly three, uh, to, to dealing with the pandemic. The first is a general proposition about interfering with, uh, with our individual liberties, which is the one you referred to. Um, I, I think that to some extent, it's a, it's a, the first point to be made is that the government was having to act in a hurry in relation to an unknown threat which was unanticipated. We can criticise them to some extent for the extent to which it was unanticipated. We can criticise them to a more than little extent uh, for the way in which they failed to appreciate what was going to happen when they saw it already at work in Italy. Uh, but they were faced with a problem where they had to decide how to act, on which there were a variety of potential opinions, ranging from the relatively extreme view that you let it rip to the other view that you shut down the whole place. And we see, I suppose, the differences between Florida and the United States and China at the two extremes. There isn't really a right answer. The government, to some extent, um, fought a middle course, a bit of a chaotic middle course. 
But I'm not sure that I go along with Lord Sumption on this. I, I, I didn't agree with everything, the government, with a lot of what the government decided. But I think it's a question of no right answer in many aspects. And I, I, I don't go along with him largely on this. Where I think he's on stronger ground is, first of all, in his argument that the government completely confused either through ignorance or through um, artfulness, uh, the difference between legislation and guidance. Um, and it, it's a measure, in a way, of a problem that I think we are seeing getting worse, not better, since I've been a judge, and that is politicians being astonishingly unaware of fundamental principles of law. Um, when I was um, president of the Supreme Court, I suggested to the clerk of the House of Commons, who is a sort of head of the running the House of Commons, he's not a political figure, but he knows his politics very well. I suggested that we should arrange for meetings between the members of the Supreme Court and groups of MPs so that we could tell them how we saw life and they could tell us how they saw life. Um, and he said he thought that was a brilliant idea, subject to one problem. And I said, what was the problem? And he said, none of the MPs will come. <laughs> um, and that is the problem. There is, to a lawyer, to a judge, curiously, a, a, a lack of interest, let alone understanding, of fundamental legal issues. And they're not technical legal issues like um, the law of easements. It's, 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 it's <laughs> fundamental principles like what is primary legislation, what is secondary legislation, uh, what is guidance, what requires you to observe the law, what is a crime, what is civilly <laughs> dealable with, and so on. And, and, you, you, it, it, and that, I think, is he rightly identified uh, uh, as a serious problem. And it does the public no favours if politicians don't understand the difference and, indeed, m make gain advantage in terms of relying on the fact that nobody understands the difference. The other final point, which uh, was tested in courts and Jonathan's view failed, but I think it was quite an interesting and tenable view, was that the government proceeded to introduce the emergency rules by secondary legislation under a statute which was not appropriate and which made it much easier for them to introduce secondary legislation than under the Emergency Powers Act, which he says they should have used. That argument was rejected by the Court of Appeal, and the Supreme Court refused leave to appeal. So they didn't think there was much in that argument. I thought Jonathan had a reasonably good argument there. But that, that was a technical legal point. Uh, this will be the last question before I go into um, audience questions. And I, I guess there's a last question. Many in this room probably want to enter the legal professions. Um, what, what, what one single piece of advice would you give them? Be lucky. Um, <laughs> I, I, that's not entirely frivolous. Um, I, I think it's not a very helpful message to give anybody, but there's no doubt that luck does play an enormous part in your career. And you've probably all seen this already, people who you think have done rather better than they deserve through a lucky break, people who've done worse <laughs> than they deserve through a lucky break. And that is true. And I think, at least for the reason that you should be ready for it, it's important to appreciate that. Also, there's an element of grabbing your luck when it comes, but often you don't know what's good luck. I mean, when I look back on my career, a number of events that seemed um, not just unexpected, but positively disadvantageous and occasionally disastrous, in retrospect, were very beneficial. I tried to join very good um, commercial chambers. In those days, totally unlike now, it was very easy to get a pupillage because pupillages weren't paid. So a set of chambers like Essex Court Chambers, one of the leading commercial sets, had about 25 members of chambers and 10 pupils. Now they have about 110 members of chambers and three or four pupils because they have to pay them. <laughs> it's not as cynical as it sounds, because if you get a pupillage, you're very likely to be taken on. In those days, if you got a pupillage, you might do six-month work and be told to buzz off. 
And I had three such pupillages. I had three successive pupillages where I was turned down, two in, um, one in a commercial set, Essex Court, as it happens, and two in chancery sets. And I had to settle. I, had a, I almost gave up, but I had to settle for a not-so-distinguished property law set. And I really was quite disappointed. And, and the third time I was rejected, quite devastated. Looking back on it, it was the best thing that happened to me. First of all, it made me a bit tougher and appreciate my luck when it turned. And secondly, the sort of work and circumstances of the work that I was doing in the property set of chambers, not nearly as grand, not as well paid, but it suited me much better than the work that I would have done in the chambers I wanted to get into. And I think that taught me that can't even recognize your luck when it comes along because you don't quite know what's going to happen. So I think the advice I got given when I finally found Chambers that would take me and then my career, I was, had a very fortunate career, but there was a QC there, a very nice man, probably too nice to be a good barrister in some ways, <laughs> um, said uh, one day to me, he said, David, what do you think the most important quality to be a good barrister is? And I said, Intelligence, integrity, hard work. And he said, yeah, yeah, they're all important. But above all, high spirits. Mm -hmm. And it's quite true. You know, when I went through that difficult period of not finding chambers, when as a barrister or solicitor or indeed in any other career, I suppose, you go through a patch of losing cases or upsetting clients or getting things wrong, you need to have high spirits to carry on through and to realise that things will turn and just persevere. So... I haven't got a great deal to say. Um, the other thing I would say is, and this is probably actually maybe the most important thing, you're, most of you are probably late teens, early 20s. Your life and work expectancies are such that you're going to be 80 before you have to stop work. So if in your 20s you don't immediately know what you want to do or you don't find what you want to do, don't worry. And if you think you know what you want to do, give it a go. If it doesn't work and you, quote, wasted two or three years of your life pursuing a career that hasn't worked out either because it wasn't what you thought or because you just didn't make a success of it, in the context of your overall career, that's nothing. I had that, I suppose. You could say I don't think I wasted my time doing chemistry. I think I probably did waste my time in investment banking. <laughs> and I did spend a lot of time as a pupil not finding chambers. But that, in the end, didn't make that much difference to my career. And my career was shorter than yours because as life expectancy gets longer and economics as such, your careers will be longer. And provided you're doing something in your 20s that is constructive and demanding, that's useful. Even I say I wasted my time in banking. In fact, I think it taught me a bit about commerce, a bit about dealing and so on, which probably helped me as a barrister. So you don't waste your time doing things if you, if you, if you have tried at something and haven't succeeded. That isn't a waste. So you should be prepared to see your 20s as a time for working and experimenting and trying things out and not regarding it as a failure if you need to move on to something else. I think that's probably my most important message. So we will go on to audience questions. And get the mic. Um, so I'll start with, um, I'll start over here with John T. Your Lordship. Thank you very much for answering all those questions. I had one question in relation to the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal. And obviously, unlike a lot of courts in common law jurisdictions, it's got judges from, well, who, who've spent time in a lot of other common law jurisdictions. And I was wondering, do you think that that's something that other countries could learn from that's beneficial, or do you think that it's not necessarily so beneficial? I like the idea of um, cross-fertilisation between different common law jurisdictions. Um, it's interesting to see how, although Australia and New Zealand and Hong Kong and Singapore have got the common law 
they develop some common law principles differently, consciously differently, from the way that we do in the UK and vice versa. I think a degree of cross-fertilisation between the different countries would be a very attractive idea if you could get an Australian judge to sit in the Supreme Court or Court of Appeal or a UK judge sitting in the High Court in Australia. I suspect it's cloud cuckoo land. One of the troubles is that you would have to select cases which were appropriate, where it didn't matter, the judge didn't, under, didn't understand the details of how life in England might differ from Australia. But in fact, in this country, we've had a history of doing this and still have it in the form of the uh, Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, which, as you know, is made up mostly of Supreme Court judges uh, who uh, try uh, appeals from, if I might put it this way, Caribbean islands, uh, the Channel Islands, uh, the Isle of Man, a number of other places, uh, which basically were in, in colonies, uh, now are either in, independent or protectorates, or British overseas territories, as they're called, uh, and are too small to have a Supreme Court of their own, and therefore use the uh, Privy Council. In the long run, I suspect the Privy Council's days are numbered. Some Caribbean countries have already got together to have an Eastern Caribbean final appeal court, uh, whereby, uh, in, if, if they're each too small to have their own appeal court, top appeal court, second appeal court, they can get together and have a joint one. But I, I think that there is a danger that if you have all English or UK judges deciding a case um, which is based in Jamaica, it does seem a bit odd. But if you had four Jamaican judges and a UK judge, that would introduce a degree of cross-fertilisation that would be interesting. The Singapore court has now taken on what the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal has done, and the Singapore court has an international commercial court. They have a lot of judges from, ex-judges from UK, Australia, New Zealand, even one or two civilian court countries, there's a French judge, for example, Japanese judge has just joined, who try some of their international cases. And they have, um, on the International Court of Appeal, they will normally have two Singapore judges and a, a, a foreign judge. It works very well. I, I sit there, too. Um, so I think it'd be a nice idea, but I don't think it'll happen in the UK. And the next question, I'll just go to Saifuna. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lord Neuberger. Um, so I had a question. Uh, what are your views on the writings of scholars like Trevor Allen and, to an extent, your late friend, Lord Justice Laws, that parliamentary sovereignty could be limited to some extent? and subjected to higher order principles like the rule of law? I think my view has always been that if Parliament does something, enacts legislation, which, despite one's attempts to interpret it otherwise, uh, would be an anathema, uh, such as getting rid of judicial review, then we'd have reached a point politically where the question of what the judges would do would probably be academic. But that is rather a sliding out of the question answer. Um, I, I think that I can just see, not that it happened to me, fortunately, if I had such a case when I was in the Supreme Court, I would have to agonise about whether there were exceptions to the rule that parliamentary sovereignty prevails all the time, or whether there could be exceptions touched on in the hunting bill case in Jackson, for example, as well as by the writers you mentioned, where the judges would say this is so outside uh, the constitutional principles on which this country is run that we're not going to give effect to it. I think that if I'd had to decide that, I probably would have gone for the latter view and said there may be extreme cases where it's a judge's duty 
to say you cannot do this. But it would be a fairly extreme thing to do, but I think the other approach, it's hypothetical, one doesn't know what the acting question is saying, but um, if it was such that I couldn't bring myself, there'd be a third option, which I suppose would be to resign. <laughs> but that really would be a bit pathetic. <laughs> so I think I'd probably go for that option, but I was lucky enough not to be faced with it. Anyone else? Lord Sumption, I think, would have gone the other way. <laughs> um, I just had a question, and it's something that you've touched on already, and you've talked about the government's overtures about judicial review, and obviously these last few years have been quite a febrile atmosphere towards judicial structures, like the infamous, I think it was the Daily Mail headline, and it's about enemies of the people. Do we think, do, well, do you think that now that the sort of bigger Brexit deal has done, obviously we've still got issues around Northern Ireland, that that febrile moment has passed, or do you think actually there's still sort of dangers or there's still a very intense atmosphere lingering, lingering in sort of the British public, but also more in the government as well? I think that's a very difficult question to answer. It's a very good question. It involves sort of predicting political events and political feelings. My suspicion and hope is that we have got through a difficult period, and while there are still difficult moments to come, we've largely come through the most difficult period. Um, and to be fair to all concerned, we haven't got really near seriously undermining the rule of law. There's been quite a lot of shouting, but um, I, I, I don't think I ever felt that we were seriously under threat. But it's not been comfortable, you're right. Um, one thing I have observed is that since I retired, and perhaps more significantly since Lady Hell retired, uh, the Supreme Court, in terms of judicial review, in a couple of cases, seems to be moving in a slightly more conservative, uh, less expansionist um, way root, um, to some people that's been criticised um, on the basis that the judges are losing their nerve and are actually trimming their sails to ensure the politicians don't uh, come uh, to cut their um, paths down. I see things slightly differently. I think that the, it's inevitable however much you try and avoid it, particularly in cases involving human rights and judicial review, that a judge's temperament, that a judge's political with a small p approach uh, will influence his or her view as to, in some cases, to whether to intervene or not. And I think the individuals in the Supreme Court, particularly with the retirement of Lady Hale and Lord Kerr, have become somewhat less interventionist and more conservative by nature. And therefore, it's not entirely surprising that there's been some pulling back. Viewed more globally, I think one has to be quite careful about seeing things too extremely. Everything in the moment seems terribly significant. Uh, and then in retrospect, it seems you see it rather better in history. Things look very different in the rearview mirror as they do from looking ahead. We've had, probably since Annie's, the Annie's Minnick decision in 1968-69, we, we've had about 50 years of judicial expansion, driven by a variety of factors, including by Parliament through statutes such as the Human Rights Act. If we are, and I'm not sure we are, but if we are entering a period of judicial horns being drawn in a bit, it may not be unreasonable or unnatural to have a period of consolidation or even pulling back a bit. Um, personally, I think that we were in quite a good position in 2020, 2021. Uh, but if things are being pulled back a bit, I think one shouldn't be too concerned. Although, obviously, one will have to wait and see how things develop. Mm -hmm. 
I love this. It's brilliant. <laughs> um, given the current political climate in Hong Kong, do you think it's still appropriate for British Supreme Court justices to sit as non-permanent judges on the Court of Final Appeal? The arguments, as so often, as I've said more than once in answer to questions, <laughs> I hope I don't do that to the question. Um, I, I think the, the arguments, as is often the case, are quite finely balanced. On the one hand, British judges, you can say, should not be administering laws in a place where the laws are offensive and interfere with personal liberty uh, and are not such as we would accept uh, for a moment in this country. On the other hand, uh, you can argue that judges ultimately are concerned uh, with the rule of law, not democracy or politics. And if uh, the judges, by going uh, to Hong Kong for reasons of um, history as much as anything else, are able to make uh, the judicial system and the, democratic, and, and the rule of law better than it otherwise would be, then it's wrong for them to pull out and if they pull out, they certainly won't make things better and will arguably make things worse. I can't, I, I, I'm at the moment, as you know, a judge there. I was a judge there when I was uh, a president of the Supreme Court. I didn't have this problem because by the time I retired, the Chinese still were not, as it were, running Hong Kong, although they were, had overview responsibilities and did interfere a bit. But, no more than was envisaged in 1996 when the handover took place. Um, if I were uh, in the Supreme Court now, I would still be prepared to sit in Hong Kong, but I would feel that we were quite near the point where, it, 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 if things go on developing the way they are, where I couldn't go on sitting. <coughs> I, I, as I say, I, I can't say that people who say they should, that, that the serving judges should leave Hong Kong, serving UK Supreme Court judges should stop sitting in Hong Kong. I can't say they're wrong, but I think the balance is still in favour of them sitting. If they don't sit, if they cease to sit, if Lord Reid, the President of the Court, and Lord Hodge, the Deputy President, cease sitting in Hong Kong, then the question is, should someone like me, who is no longer a serving judge in this country, go on sitting? I'll have to decide that uh, as and when. But at the moment, I think I can do more to help Hong Kong to support the excellent judges there at the moment. Uh, and that outweighs uh, the arguments that I accept exist the other way. Uh, I want to go upstairs. Do, uh, <laughs> are, are you sure you want to throw it? I think that was sensible, but a bit of a shame. So the judiciary has, um, well, certainly in recent years, been very dominated by white men and struggled, especially within the Supreme Court, with a lack of representation from women and ethnic minorities. Do you think that steps sh um, should be taken to change that, especially on the Supreme Court, which is meant to represent the country? Or do you think that would jeopardize the function of the Supreme Court and the current selection process? The easy answer to that is, you're, first of all, you're absolutely right. There is an imbalance in terms of women, in terms of ethnic minorities. On the Supreme Court, uh, in the Court of Appeal, and in the High Court. Uh, as you go down the system, it gets less bad. And if you go to the tribunals and county court and circuit judges, it's, it's less bad. The question then is what you should do about it. 
the, partly the origin of the problem lies in, in the legal profession because judges are selected from barristers and to a lesser extent, but significantly from solicitors. And I'm afraid that you look at the proportion of QCs who are women, I think the figure's about 13% which means that if you've got 25% of women in the High Court, and the most High Court judges are selected from QCs, the system is already, as it were, trying to make up for the imbalance. But 25% is exactly half as many women as there should be. And in the Supreme Court, you've got, at the moment, they've got 10 because they've got two retirements, and only one of those 10 is a, is a woman. Again that is significantly less than should be, and they're all white. What should you do about it? Um, well, what you should certainly not do is to lower standards, but what you should certainly do is to do everything that doesn't involve lowering standards to improve the representation. And one thing that could certainly be done is, as I think has been done on one or two occasions, to accelerate a promotion which would otherwise uh, be delayed a bit more, and above all, to encourage people who maybe don't apply to apply. I mean, it, it's certainly, from my experience, true that, again, this is a broad generalisation, there are many exceptions both ways, but if you advertise for a job that has ten qualities that are needed, a man will say, well, I've got six of those, that's fine, I'll apply. A woman is much more likely to say, well, I've only got nine, so I better not apply. <laughs> and I think women are, are, are more... There are, as I say, exceptions, and I can be accused of typecasting. But I think that's the sort of problem that partly leads to this imbalance, and that, that can be dealt with by encouragement. The extent... I used to be completely against positive discrimination, but I can see an argument for it. And at least to the extent of, of, of having the tipping point. In other words, if you've got two candidates who are roughly equal, you'd certainly go for the under person from the underrepresented group. But I think that people sometimes cheat on that, and some people say no two candidates are exactly equal. But I rather take a different view. I think that, that, that equality is quite a broad concept here, because people are so different into what they bring that equality is quite broad because you can't really compare two people who have different qualities and often they will be equal because they'll bring different sorts of qualities and it's hard, it's very much of a subjective value judgment to say which is better. So I think we could probably do a bit better in terms of positive discrimination in the sense of making sure that we don't reject somebody who is not equal, who, who is as good as somebody else, but we're not appreciative of the existence of the degree of equality which really exists. Not very well put, I'm sorry. And I think on top of that, um, the biggest problem is um, unconscious bias, which is so easy to say and so difficult to deal with. But I think looking back on my involvement in selection of people at various stages of my life, mostly as a judge, I think I was more guilty of unconscious bias than I was aware. By definition, it's difficult to know how, what one's unconscious bias was. But I think I, certainly to begin with, had a very, probably a very traditional idea of what a judge should be like. And I, I think that's a, a benefit of the new system of the Judicial Appointments Commission, is that you have people who have a much fresher idea, many of whom are not lawyers, that helps appoint people. But I don't have a magic bullet other than agreeing that any solution or proposed solution to improving <coughs> the um, balance uh, of, of, of um, judges, particularly in the upper courts, uh, should be looked at because we do have a problem. And as I say, the problem does in the end come back to the legal profession where the imbalance is greater and as we fish in that pond, uh, it is difficult to increase, improve things much more than has been done, at least in the lower courts, in the Court of Appeal, in the High Court. I think you will see things improving. When I was in the 
High Court uh, in the late 90s and early uh, parts of this century, early two years of this century. The um, proportion of women judges was under 10% in the High Court. Now it's 25%. <coughs> the Court of Appeal selects from the High Court. The Supreme Court selects largely from the Court of Appeal. And I think we will see an improvement there. <coughs> so far as non-white ethnic minorities are concerned, <coughs> I think the problem's greater um, in terms of the imbalance is even more marked in the upper <coughs> judiciary. Um, all I can say is that I'm conscious, they're conscious of it and doing their best to do something about it. Um, I've talked to the present chair of the Judicial Appointments Commission, <coughs> Lord Kekar, and uh, he has certainly been conscious of it in the eight years in which he's held that job. So I don't have a magic answer. I agree it's a problem, and I agree that everything that should be done about it could be done about it should be done and that um, things have got better, but they have a long way to go. Well, I think we have time for one more question. We'll go at top. A uh, person there. Hello. Yeah, I think the last question will be uh, less academic. And uh, so as a law student, we sometimes read the um, dictum of the dissenting judges in passing. But most of the time, we tend to focus on the, um, the majority. So my question will be two folds. First one, like, what do you think is the importance of the dissenting judge's opinion? Secondly, as a judge yourself, how do you deal with it when there are disagreements amongst like, you guys? Thank you. Um, I used to think that the most pointless exercise was to give a dissenting judgment in the Supreme Court. Because if you gave a dissenting judgment in the Court of Appeal, you could always secretly hope the case would go to the Supreme Court and they'd agree with you. Um, but I think dissenting judgments have a value. Um, even in the Supreme Court, because sometimes, particularly when the judge is progressive, um, he or she will be setting the scene for uh, the law developing in, in the way that is proposed in the, in, in the dissenting judgment and giving a peg on which to a future judge in another case could hang his or her decision. It would be easier for the Supreme Court after 10 years to say we think that the, mind, that the dissenting view in a case 10 years ago was right, than to say we think they all got it wrong 10 years ago. And also in some areas of law, where the law is developing, like unjust enrichment is a good example, a dissenting judgment can be very valuable because it makes you, makes academics, makes academics more interested, engages um, enables parties to engage, the judges and the academics to engage with each other and to discuss the law and take it further. Eighty years ago, the judges took very little notice of what academics wrote. That has changed enormously over the past few years and very much for the benefit of the law. And I think that academics writing about judgments from a different perspective and criticizing judgments, or sometimes being nice about judgments, do make judges think. And the dialogue between academics and judges is valuable. If you throw in a dissenting judgment, that can add to the mix and add to the potential for the law developing in a good way. As for relations between judges who, who are in the majority and dissent, it was quite interesting, in my experience, some judges, when they'd written a judgment, took it almost as a personal offence if one of their colleagues disagreed and wrote a dissenting judgment. I, I never took that view. I, I thought it was fine. It, each judge has to give his or her own view. The difficult questions were twofold. One is, if the case isn't very important, and if you only mildly disagree, is there a point in writing a dissenting judgment? One view is, if your view is albeit only just, that you'd go the other way, then your duty as a judge is to say so. The other view is that the court isn't just individual judges, it's a collective group, and that if you don't feel very strongly and if the case isn't very important, why clutter up the law reports with a dissenting judgment? No right answer. 
The second problem about dissenting judgments, which I sometimes had to deal with, was I do find, and I think all judges find, that you feel particularly strongly when you write a dissenting judgment. And sometimes uh, a judge gets slightly carried away. Um, any of you who read uh, US um, Supreme Court judgments will know how judges such as uh, Scalia can express themselves. And they can really be very rude about uh, the majority. And I am afraid I rather priggishly took the view that judges should not be rude about each other because that, if judges of the Supreme Court are rude about each other, it's not exactly going to help the prestige and standing of the Supreme Court. So occasionally I found myself going to a colleague and saying, look, this dissenting judgment, fine, but could you just rephrase that a bit? And one that always stuck in my mind was one of my colleagues writing in a judgment, I am astonished by my colleague's decision that. And we negotiated a bit, and he eventually wrote, uh, with my agreement, some people might be surprised by my... <laughs> And um, maybe I was a bit wet, and maybe it makes people's life less fun. But I think it's quite important that the judges show each other mutual respect. And to be fair, they did. What actually I think are more interesting and more worrying, aren't so much dissenting judgments, actually as concurring judgments. I mean, if I write a judgment which sets out the law and sets out my conclusions, what on earth is the point of you writing a judgment saying you agree? and then spending 10 pages saying you agree. Either you're going to say you agree in exactly the same words, which is absurd, you wouldn't do that, or you're going to use different words. And the risk then is that clever lawyers later find subtle distinctions between you, and the law is less clear. And I think that what you have to avoid is a pointless concurring judgment. Obviously, sometimes you say, I agree with what the main judge has written, but I do think actually his reasons or her reasons aren't quite right and I would put them differently. That's fair enough. That's not what I would call a pointless concurring judgment because it's like a dissenting judgment. You're disagreeing in certain points. I should say so, um, subject to the point I first made. But I think the trouble is that I've written what I call vanity judgments. You think gosh, I've seen what my colleague says, I could write a better judgment than that. <laughs> or, this is really interesting, I want to write a judgment on this. Um, and, um, or, I really want to show I've understood this. <laughs> and, and that's the sort of judgment you've got to avoid. By all means, write it, but then put it in the drawer. Um, <laughs> but as I say, I don't want to seem too priggish, because I've written vanity judgments that have gone out in the law reports. I shouldn't have done, but I have. And they, I think, are more dangerous because, of course, for you, it's bad enough reading some of these endless judgments. But if you've got to read five endless judgments, all apparently saying the same thing. I mean, I've said before that it's very dispiriting reading a judgment and finding halfway through you've lost the will to live. <laughs> but, it, it's, it, but I assure you it's doubly depressing when you discover it's one of your own judgments. So, yes, I, I think dissenting judgments have more to be said for them than many concurring judgments. Uh, all I said that was a final question. I noticed someone put their hands up over there. Yeah. <laughs> that would be the last one. personal sense of morality impacts your judgments rather than solely operate within the bounds of statutory and common law? You're absolutely right. Um, you have, in a way, to keep your sense of personal opinions to yourself and not go with them. But in a sense, you have to let your personal opinions to some extent about whether people should be honest, whether something's fair, and so on. Um, I think the case that really brought it home to me, and it's why someone, we've mentioned him more than once, like Lord Sumption, objects to people getting judges being politically involved, but it's inevitable that we are. The case that I always think of in relation to that particular issue was a case called Nicklinson. Uh, that involved the question of whether a man, as it happens it was, who had suffered a terrible stroke and could move his neck and eyelids and that was all, and was 
never going to recover and was in some pain, just wanted help to die. He had saw no point in his life. But he couldn't do it himself, therefore he needed help. And under the Suicide Act 1961, anyone who helped him would be guilty of an offence and liable to be put in prison for up to 14 years. So he came to the, court, the Supreme Court eventually saying, this is contrary to my human rights. I've got the right of self-determination. I want to die. I'm entitled to commit suicide, which is the law now, of course. And therefore, I should be allowed to be helped. Uh, I felt that we, nine of us sat on the case. And I, I felt that all of us found it quite hard to put aside our own personal views. Um, and um, I, I think certainly some of my colleagues, and I suspect me as well, were influenced significantly in what we decided by our personal views. Um, I strongly felt and do strongly feel that the law should be changed and it was quite wrong that he was not able to be assisted to commit suicide, provided, of course, appropriate safeguards were in place. <coughs> and I was very tempted to go along with Lady Hale and Lord Kerr, who were the two members of the court who uh, said that um, this was contrary to human rights. But in the end, I went along with two other colleagues, um, Lord Wilson and Lord Mance, and we said that the courts might have to intervene, but at this stage, we felt Parliament still had to look at it quite closely. The trouble is that it involves a moral judgment, as you say, and to what extent should the courts be imposing a moral judgment on Parliament? And I think we felt that the courts could, but it would require a bit more work from Parliament before we felt we could. But four people, four other members of the court, the remaining four, said effectively this was a no-go area for the courts. It was purely for Parliament. And I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty confident that four of us felt the law was as it should be, and five of us felt the law should be changed. And I think we were all influenced in that. And I think that was the high watermark or low watermark of the cases I did where I felt that our views influenced our decision. But there are other cases. I mean, I've already referred to the fact that certain members of the court when I was there were undoubtedly, politically, with a small p, uh, more prepared to take the law forward, take certain, certain policies further forward um, through the courts than others in terms of interfering with government decisions, holding government decisions to be wrong. I think that um, Lady Hale and Lord Kerr were much more ready to, no, probably not much, were more ready to interfere uh, with government decisions, uh, unprogressive government decisions, than, say, uh, Lord Hughes or Lord Sumption. And I think the rest of us were sort of more in the middle. And to pretend that that plays no part in judges' decision-making does nobody any favours, because it's not true. But I think you have to try and ensure that your views don't overwhelm you, as it were. And I would like to have said in the Nicholson case that the law should be changed, but I, I felt that was too much letting my own private views um, prevail over what I felt was appropriate for a judge to be doing. I still wonder if I got it right, but that's what I thought at the time, and I like to think it was the right decision, but. I was going to say time will tell, but time probably never will. Uh, I think that's all we have time for this evening. Can we have a huge round of applause for... <laughs>